you have your Bibles, turn to Numbers, the 13th chapter. We're going to spend a good portion of time in Numbers, the 13th chapter. Tonight I want to, I want to talk just briefly about a situation, a problem that we have, that we have developed from childhood. And as children, we become experts at it. And as we get older and as we mature, we become better and better at it. The problem is that sometimes we overlook it. And we don't think much about it. How many of you have ever given an excuse? Should everybody raise their hand, right? We've all given an excuse of some point. We've all told our teacher, the dog ate my homework. We've all told mom, you know, I would have gone outside and done what you told me to do, but... And you can fill in the blank, correct? The problem is, is that over time, we become experts at excusing, don't we? We become experts at giving excuses for what we should have done, but we didn't do. Oftentimes, we think excuses are going to help us to get out of the problem, but every time you give an excuse, has that ever got you out of anything? Sometimes it becomes more stressful when we give an excuse than if we just would have done the act just then, correct? Because often when we give an excuse, we're always looking over our shoulder saying, you know, is, is mom going to catch me? Is dad going to catch me? Is my teacher going to catch me? We make excuses for ourselves. We make excuses for others. And many times, in a lot of ways, we make excuses for God, don't we? And what I mean by that is when we make excuses for ourselves, well, I would have done that, but something took, took over. We look at somebody else sinning and we say, you know what, that brother is going through a really hard time and uh, let's just give them a pass. It's okay. We make excuses for God because we look at God and say, God, I know you're a great God, but would God really condemn somebody for doing this little sin? Excuses are all around us, aren't they? In Numbers, the 13th chapter, were told a, an event that happened in history where the Israelites, after they had left Egypt, they had traveled up to the border of Canaan, at the very bottom, and God tells them to select 12 men, a man from every tribe, to go up and search the land to see what kind of land this is going to be, the land that, they were, that Abraham was promised. Now, these individuals were not just anybody. They were actually the leaders. They were the ones that were in charge of their tribes. When we talk about tribes, we're talking about families. We're talking about cousins. We're talking about people who are the descendants of Abraham. So each one represented a great-grandson of Abraham. Numbers 13 or verse 2 tells us about that. And we sometimes forget that these individuals had seen a lot. They had seen the plagues of Egypt. They crossed the sea into the dry, onto dry land. They saw the destruction of Egypt's mighty army at the hand of God. They saw all these things. They were present. These individuals that are, we, we call them the 12 spies, they were present at Mount Sinai. They received the law. They had said, yes, God, we're going to obey you. They saw manna in the morning. They, they were able to collect quail. They saw the things that God had given to them. They'd seen all these things firsthand. So in Numbers the 13th chapter, verses 17 through 20, I want to read this together. Numbers 13, verses 17 through 18. It says, Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up, into this, go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like, where the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, where the land they dwell is in good or bad, where their cities they inhabit are like camps or stronghold. Whether the land is rich or poor, whether they are forced there or not, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. The time was the season of the first ripe grape. We know that through history, the Israelites were not a warring people. They were not a military people. They were a shepherding people. They didn't have a military background. They didn't have the things that other nations had. And so Moses, with, with God's advice, says, send some spies in the land and check this out and see what kind of land you're going to be inheriting. See what the land is like. See what the people are like. See what's all around you. 
And we know that these individuals went and spent about 40 days, Numbers 13 and verse 25. They spent about 40 days wandering through the land, seeing all they could see. And they even bring back some of the, we, we would call them spoils, not really spoils of war, but some of the things that they saw and they brought back some of those things to show people. This is what the land is like. This is what the land is producing. And what's interesting is the first thing they say in Numbers 13 and verse 27 is that all 12 spies come back to Israel and tell them this land is full of milk and honey. If there was a land that was made for us, there's no other land that, that's perfect for us. This is exactly what we need. I, I thought about that as I read this passage. And do you realize that they really are saying two things? You know, milk is produced by what? Livestock, right? And so in one way, they're saying this is perfect for our livestock. This is perfect for our sheep, for our goats. The things that we are herding, this is the perfect land for them. How much control do they have over honey? Little or none, correct? And so in some ways, they're saying this land is perfect, not only perfect for our needs, but the land itself also produces what we need as well, without any help from us. This is the perfect situation, exactly what we need to go into. They also report in verse 28, now again, it's not negative, but they also make a report that in this land there are many men that are very strong and powerful men. There are cities that are fortified. There are, there are great things. There's some issues within this land. There's some problems with this land. And at some point, the spies are asked their advice. You know, tell us what you think. What can we do? Should we go and invade, or, or what's your advice? And in Numbers, the 14th chapter, verses 7 and 8, we know the two spies. We know Caleb and Joshua. Say, you know what? With God's help, doesn't matter how big or mighty they are, doesn't matter how fortified those cities are, with God's help, we are able to conquer that land, and God will give it to us, regardless of who we are, regardless of how powerful the army is, or what kind of backing we have, we will be able to take the city. But the ten, the other ten men, in Numbers 13, verses 31 through 33. If you have Bibles, let's, let's read that together. Numbers 13, verses 31 through 33. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land, which they spied out, saying... The land which, it, which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great statue. There, they, there we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in their own sight. And so we were in their sight. The two men gave reports that says, with God we can do anything. But the ten men gave excuses, didn't they? It's a great land. It's, a, it's, it's wonderful. God promised that to us. But we can't do it. We can't do it because we're not prepared. The excuses they, they gave was the fact that they would lose to these mighty men. Who are we? We're shepherds. How can we compete with this army? How can we compete with these big cities? And not only that, not only these big cities, but you know, over time, if we lose... We're going to lose our family heritage. We're going to lose who we are. We're going to be assimilated into the, into the environment that it's in. It's better for us to stay where we are and just continue as a family. If we go there, we might not have our family anymore. The nation as a whole listened and accepted the excuses of the ten men. And as a result of their accepting those excuses, spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Now at some point they were able to go and conquer the land of Canaan. We know historically that that's what happened. The problem is that sometimes it's easier just to do something than it is to accept excuses, isn't it? It's easier to just do what God asked us to do than, quit, than continually making excuses for why we can't. A couple I don't want to say the great excuses of the Bible, but some of the, the great excuses of the Bible were found in Genesis in the first four chapters. Genesis, the third chapter, we know the story. Adam and Eve fall to the sin of the serpent. They eat the forbidden fruit. And when God comes to, to Adam and says, why did you do this? Do you remember what Adam said? He said, it's the woman, right? 
It's the woman. And not only does he blame the woman, but he said, it's the woman that you gave me. Adam blames two people, doesn't he? He blames the woman, his spouse, and he blames God. He says, God, if you wouldn't have given me this, this woman, and if this woman wouldn't have put this in front of me, I wouldn't have sinned. God turns to Eve and says, why did you do this? And what does she say? You know, if Satan wouldn't have put that fruit in front of me, Just the fourth chapter, we're introduced to Cain and Abel, right? Remember, Cain kills his brother Abel. God comes to him and says, where's your brother? And what excuse does Cain say? Am I my brother's keeper? Am I responsible for the actions of my brother? It's an excuse, isn't it? I'm going to blame everybody else. Am I, am I responsible for the actions of everybody else around me? Well, no, but you're responsible for your own actions, aren't you? Cain murdered his brother. That's what he was responsible for. But instead, he woke to everybody else. The fact remains that no one is responsible for my actions but me. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 tells us that we will all give an account of ourselves to God. At some point, we're going to stand before God. Regardless of my spouse, regardless of my children, the environment that I'm in, I'm going to have to stand before God and say, this is what I did and this is the reason why I did it. God's not going to accept any, any excuse, is He? Well, I would have obeyed you, but you know what? This was going on in my life. I was going to do that, but you know, the dog ate my homework. God knows. God understands. At some point we realize that God has promised us an eternal life or a land within our reach. He's promised us an eternal life in heaven for those who live according to the law perfectly. In some ways, a land of milk and honey. A land free of the problems we see in this world. When we live in this world, we look and we often say, I wish I could just be in a place where there's no war, there's no hatred, that there's love, and that people just get along and there's no problems. And God has said, I've got that for you. It's waiting for you. It's just within your reach. The problem is, is that we as men, we all sin. Romans 3 and verse 23 tells us that all men have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all sin, but the problem is, is that we always make excuses on why we can't go to heaven. Why we can't obey God's law. We make excuse after excuse after excuse, don't we? Sometimes it's God's law is too hard and God would never make man do whatever we want to put there. Sometimes we hear, if God was a loving God, He wouldn't make me. Or you know what, if, if God is really who He is and I'm happy, then God will be happy. So I can do whatever I want because obviously God wants me to be happy, correct? But that's an excuse, isn't it? That, that's basically saying, God, I understand what you're telling me, but I'd rather do something different. God has provided a perfect sacrifice to eliminate our excuses we may have. John 3 and verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. The excuse of, you know, God, I know you want me to live perfectly, but I can't do that is no longer acceptable, is it? Because Jesus died for you and for me. Jesus lived a perfect life and gave himself so that we no longer have that excuse to go to God and say, God, I know that you, what you want me to do, but I can't do that. No man can do what you've asked of me. It's been a short, less night, but you have a choice tonight. You, you have something you need to think about tonight. You can accept the excuses the world gives for not going to heaven. You can go to the world and say, God, I, I know what you expect of me, but the things around me, the, the armies are, are so fortified in this land, and the soldiers' land are so mighty that I just have to basically assimilate into this land, and there's nothing I can do about it. Or, you can accept the truth and become a child of God or continue to be a child of God. Those are the choices you have tonight. I want to make sure we, we clearly understand what we're talking about. Regardless of who put the cookie on the table, let me an example. Regardless of who put the cookie on the table, 
how good the cookie looks or if we have had a cookie before. If God tells us not to eat the cookie, then we cannot and should not eat the cookie. There's no more excuses, is it there? There's no more, well, God, you know, if you didn't have put the cookie there on the table, I would have been tempted to sin. If the, if, if the woman or, or, or this person hadn't given me the cookie, I wouldn't have been tempted to sin. If, you know, society hadn't put the cookie there in front of me, I wouldn't have been tempted to sin. The fact is, God said, don't eat the cookie, we shouldn't eat the cookie. Correct? We've learned to give excuses from our childhood all the way up. And sometimes we become experts at that. Not necessarily experts in giving excuses in our physical lives, but sometimes giving excuses in our spiritual lives as well. We look at ourselves and we think about what God has given to us. And we say, you know what, it's okay for me to do this because God will understand. It's okay for me to, to get involved in this because God will understand. And we don't realize that it's not about excuses, is it? It's about whether we did it or we didn't do it. Whether we obeyed God or we didn't obey God. So the lesson is yours this evening. Maybe you realize you need to become a Christian and you need to do what God has asked you to do. If we can help you in any way, we ask that you should come forward as together we stand and sing.